Okay, so <clears throat> this morning we're going to be talking about law, but I want you to hang with me because it's not going to be the kind of sermon when you normally think of Scott's going to be preaching on the law, the type of sermon that you think, okay, well, I'm going to walk out this door and realize I need to be a better person. And I'm going to think about all the things I did wrong and all the mistakes I've made. And ugh, okay, he stepped on my toes today. I'm going to step on your toes. Don't worry. But not like that. Because the law that we're talking about, the New Testament that we live under, is referred to by James as the law of liberty. He says it two times. In James 1.25, the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres. Being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And he says again in James 2, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. We just as a nation blew up so many pyrotechnics because we believe that we live in a free country where we can blow stuff up and have fun doing it and eat a lot of hamburgers and celebrate what we would think of as a law of liberty. And that, that's kind of built into what Americans think of when we think of our country as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The idea that we are a free nation. But when we say we have a law of liberty, it's different than what is intended by James. Because when we say we have a law of liberty, what we really mean is we have a, a law and a government that is of the people, and for the people, and by the people, that basically we get to make the rules and you cannot tell me how to live my life and that I have the freedom to as much as is possible as long as it does not impinge on the liberties and pursuit of happiness of another to do what I want. That's America's law of liberty. That is not Jesus' law of liberty. Jesus' law of liberty is not of the people and by the people. It is for the people. It's not a law where it says, I can, I can just do whatever I want and live however I please, and I am free in that sense. That's not what he's talking about. It is a much greater liberty than the idea that I can do what I want. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. You have to listen to the whole sermon to figure out what it is. And that's the sort of thing that brings me joy, because I do what I want. Um, <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to keep in your mind that we are people who are under the law of liberty. And then I want to go back with you to the old law, the law that Moses gave to the Jewish nation, which is not a law of liberty. In Hebrews chapter 10, in discussing that, it says, for since the law... That is the Old Testament law, has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Remember how James said we're under the perfect law, the law of liberty? The old law says you can never make anybody perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, we would not have, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. To understand how great a law that we are under, you have to understand the alternative to that law. And it was the one that the Jewish people lived under. The old law did several things. One, it never made you perfect. It never actually removes your sins. Instead, what it says, having, if they had once been cleansed, they would have no longer had any consciousness of sins. In other words, you could just let it go. You could, you could Elsa the thing and just let it go. But instead, the Jewish nation had to constantly be conscious of their sins. 
They were constantly, as it says in the next part, there is a reminder of sins every year. Every year, the Jewish nation, they would gather together for various feasts, and then the high priest would go in one time a year, and he'd go into the tabernacle, and he would go with much bloodshed. And everybody would be watching and waiting for him to go in and ask God to forgive them and take care of them for their sins. And then he would come out, and you know what they would do next year? All over again. And the whole point is, God wanted them to always remember their sins. He wanted them to be aware of it. To think about it all the time. I am a sinner. It's a tough law to live under. And in fact, it was a law that was, was so hard that it became too hard for the Jew to keep. Listen to Peter, who was a Jew by birth and spent his whole life growing up as a Jewish man. In Acts chapter 15, Peter will say of living under that law that reminded you of sins and kept you aware of it and kept you thinking about the things that you've done wrong. He says, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples? Meaning, these Christians. Don't put a yoke on their neck. A yoke's that thing that you put on an ox so it could pull a load. Why are you putting that burden on them that neither our fathers or we have been able to bear? Peter said, I've lived under both laws. And I will tell you, if you te start telling Christians they have to to live under the Jewish law, I know what it's like. It is a burden that is too heavy to bear. All of these rules that are very good rules, but I couldn't keep them. And you know Peter. You read about Peter. Peter's a good man with an honest heart. I mean, when Jesus said, come follow me, he drops everything and he follows Jesus. I... I I would love to be a Peter who was so committed to the Lord that when I saw it, when I saw what I was supposed to do, I just dropped what I was doing and just did it. But as good as Peter is, he's also kind of a knucklehead. And you see that part too, and that kind of endears you to him as well. Because there are times he didn't see it. And he says dumb things. He makes bad choices. Doesn't always live the way he should leaps before looking, talks before thinking, swings his sword before asking. This is a guy who makes some big mistakes. And under the old law, he said, look, I couldn't bear it. And my father couldn't bear it. And my grandfather couldn't bear it. Every good Jew that I've ever known, all the way back through David and further Neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear that law. In James chapter 2, in speaking about a law in general and just the idea of how law works, he says, if you show partiality, you're committing sin or convicted by the law's transgressors. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. If you read through your Old Testament, there's a lot of laws. And James says, God's not a partial God. He doesn't say, well, this law matters and this one doesn't. I know I gave you both, but this was the one I cared about. No, no. God says, these are my laws. And if you break one of those laws, it doesn't matter that there were 15 over here that you didn't break. This one over here, what are you? You're a transgressor. Because God is not a partial God. And so it became too hard to keep because I can keep these ones, but I can't keep that one. Or tomorrow, I can keep that one, but I can't keep these ones. You ever run into that issue where there are, it's like one day you're doing really well in an area, and then the next day it's like the wheels fall off? This is the life of being a human being, even a good an honest and kind-hearted one like Peter, who's just got a passion and zeal, he still gets told, get behind me, Satan. So the problem is, there's just no wiggle room for failure. There's no room to make mistakes. And you know, that's a real problem for us as human beings. Because the way that you learn as a human being, anything worth learning, you know. 
is by making mistakes. How how did you get so good at that? Well, by being bad at it. That's how it works. Whether you're learning to play the piano, or ride a unicycle, or follow the Lord, you know how you get good at it? By starting out being bad at it. But the old law left no room for being bad at it. And so only one person was ever successful at the old law. Jesus was perfect all along. And that's a good thing because you need him. But it's also a really bad thing. And here's why it's bad. Because it proves that your one excuse, that everybody has the same problem, none of us could follow God righteously. What did Jesus prove? That's not true. So when you sin, you could look at me and you say, well, I sin, but I don't sin like Scott. And you can look at somebody else and say, yeah, but I don't sin like them. And we can give our excuses when we compare ourselves to each other. But then Jesus comes along and he condemns all of us. First thing Jesus' life does is it condemns you because he does it right. You know, it's, it's like having a test in school and everybody's saying, it's too hard, it's too hard. And then that one kid, that one kid and all of you are going to beat him up at recess. He comes in and aces it, right? You were going to grade us on a curve. But now there's no curve because they got them all right. That's Jesus. Now I know the rest of the story and you know the rest of the story too. Jesus came to save. But right now we're just talking about how laws work. And I want you to understand that the old law left no room for you to fail. It left no room for you to grow because growing means you're immature. And if you're immature, you have sinned. And I don't care which sin it is. God is not a partial God. You are a transgressor and you're guilty. A criminal is a criminal. The thing is, the old law is only a problem because of me. The law itself is not a bad thing. In fact, in Romans chapter 7, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? Here's the argument. Well, if everybody fails at it, it seems to me like a bad law. Right? If you give a test and almost everybody flunks, seems to me you have a bad test, right? What shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. Oh, that's a good point. You don't, if you don't have laws, you don't know right from wrong. And do you want to live in a world where people don't know right from wrong? I don't. I don't even like living in a world where people do know right from wrong and we just do whatever we feel like doing. If you didn't have the law, you wouldn't have known. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. You, you know this feeling. Maybe you're a kid someday and your parents told you not to do something. So I'm going to leave the house. and Whatever you do, don't go into that room where the Christmas presents are. Well, I didn't want to go until you said that. Now I know what I'm doing. Thank you for building my routine while you're gone. Now I have a schedule. I have until you're gone to go through all of these and then hopefully re app them. It never works out. Sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment. Don't go into that room. Producing me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. See, that's, that's art right now. My, my six-month-old, he is alive apart from the law. He has no rules. He just lives his life just eating and napping. And it's like retirement came early. But there's going to come a day. There's going to come a day where I look into those eyes, those windows of that little boy's soul, and I say, there's cognition. And I'm going to tell him there's a rule. I don't know what that first rule will be. i got plenty of time to figure it out. There will be a rule. 
don't touch this, come back here, whatever it is. And he'll, he'll do what he's been doing all along. I'll do what I want. Babies are the most American of us, just so you know. Like, you're all Americans, but babies are more American. And I will tell him, come here. And he won't want to come here. And he'll go the other way. And he'll be dead. Because all of a sudden, he'll meet Dad the lawgiver for the first time. I'm not Dad the lawgiver to him right now. All the other kids, they know that dad. Art doesn't know that dad. He knows the dad that cuddles him and plays with him and sometimes begs him to stop crying. He knows that dad, but he doesn't know dad the lawgiver. But one day, there will be a law, and it will seize an opportunity. And that's what Paul is talking about in Romans 7. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. Whatever rule it is that I give to Art as the first one, I'll give it to him for a good reason. I, I joke a lot, but I do actually love my children. I won't make up some weird rule for no reason. It'll, it'll be something to keep him safe. It'll be something to, to help it benefit his life. And he won't follow it. The commandment that promised life will prove to be death. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. And here's the point. The law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Every law that you had in the Old Testament was there for a reason it was good. God doesn't make bad laws. The problem wasn't the law, the problem was me. That's what Peter said when he says, you put a yoke on us that neither our fathers nor us are able to bear up under. The problem's not with the law, it's with me. And when the law says, if you break one law, you're a criminal, and it's such a good law, such a perfect law that would give you the life that God intended, and you break it, you now have a big, big problem. And I'm going to describe that problem as self-loathing. Self-loathing is a real issue for good people who aren't perfect people. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. In Romans chapter 7, when Paul says, I do not understand my own actions. You ever feel that way? I don't understand my own actions. I don't even know why I did that. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it's good. You ever been in the middle of doing something dumb? And even as you're doing it, you're going, this is really dumb. And yet you keep doing it. Or, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I agree that it's wrong, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. You ever feel just inadequate to be the kind of person you should be? You ever had that feeling where you're like, if I think about all the things that God wants me to be for one more second, I'm going to scream, not because he's wrong, but because I'm just so far from being that guy. That's what Paul's saying. I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. I just, how on earth am I going to get there? And, and by the way, to add to that, you know, you know that it's possible to get there. Why? Because Jesus did it. And he was tempted in every way, just like us, yet without sin. And so Paul's left saying, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. If you look at your life and there is no forgiveness, if there is no mercy, and you look at the law and you look at what God says, and you see how short you come of that, that will lead to self-loathing. Because you will walk out from every sermon hangdog with your head every single time because every single sermon will find something to step on your toes with. It's just, oh, I cannot believe it. I, it's again. It's like Scott was writing that sermon for me again. No, Scott was writing that sermon for Scott. We just happen to have a Venn diagram where it overlaps for both of us. When you are a good person, meaning I want to do the right thing, I desire in the inner man to be who I ought to be, you know one of the first things you come to a realization of? I'm not the man I want to be. I'm not the woman I want to be. I have, I have failed at whatever I know I should be. 
I read the law and it is good and holy and righteous and I am not. So what we should expect, then if that's how it works, is that in the New Testament, when you see guys like Paul, who really did some things wrong. Look, I will tell you honestly, one of the reasons I like Paul, and I'm okay with this because Paul said I should like him for this, is because Paul makes me feel better about myself. On my worst day, I have never killed a Christian. On my worst day, I, I never had to have Jesus appear to me on a road and say, are you going to keep at this any longer? On my worst day, and yet Paul says all of those things happened to him. He cast his vote against Christians. He, he describes himself as one who was untimely born. He says, like, I'm an apostle, but it's just I kind of came in late, a late bloomer. I love Paul for a lot of reasons, but that's one of them. And Paul, when he thinks about all the things that he did, certainly he would have self-loathing. Certainly he would get up in the morning, one who had persecuted the, the church of Jesus Christ would get up every morning and think, I am the worst of the worst, and I ought to just die today. He ought to be full of self-loathing every day, right? But he's not. He's not. He doesn't have this ongoing burden of guilt. Instead, Paul is this guy full of joy. In Romans chapter 7, that same chapter where he says, the things that I shouldn't do, I find myself doing, and the things that I should do, I find myself not doing, he then says, wretched man that I am. Okay, this I get. I get this one. Wretched man that I am. Okay, Paul, self-loathing time, right? Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then the next word. What's the next word after that sentence? Thanks. Not self-loathing. Gratitude. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Paul was under a law that taught him that he could fail and be a wretched man and make big mistakes and yet be forgiven because of Jesus Christ. So he could say things like he does in Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Do you understand that what Jesus intended was for you to be able to listen to a sermon that stepped on your toes the whole time? I mean, it's, it's as if the, the, the preacher had a video camera watching your entire week and made his sermon. Oh, well, you're going to need this first. You could listen to a sermon like that and feel like it's just pinning you against the seat. And what does Paul say you should be able to always do? Rejoice. How? How is that possible? Because of Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't just condemn you because he lived perfectly and you don't. He then redeems you. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. To all who have loved his appearing. That is, you and I can be just like Paul so that whenever Jesus comes back, whether I close my eyes in death here or he comes back before that time, I can be excited about him showing up and I can love his appearing. Why? Because there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me and I can have conviction about that. And I would argue that if you cannot have conviction about that, you either have not been living as a Christian. If, if there's... And that's true. You can give up on Jesus. You can walk away from him and then you should be concerned. Or, and I think this one is very common amongst us as Christians. We can give up on Jesus. We can leave him. 
I just am aware of all the things that I do wrong. And I think that he doesn't love me enough to forgive me. And may God be found true and every one of us a liar. Jesus has shown how much he loves you. He has shown how much he's willing to forgive you of. He didn't just, it's not like Jesus came and walked on this earth and died on the cross not knowing what, was, what man was about, not knowing our sins. Where was Jesus before he was born in Bethlehem? He was up in heaven. He was with the Father. He was with the Holy Spirit. He was there when they said, let us make man in our image. He was there when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. He was there through all the atrocities of human history. And yet, seeing all the worst that we could offer, what did he do? He came down anyways. He is not naive. Do not accuse him of... of Loving you only because he doesn't understand you. He is not naive. He knew exactly what Paul had done. And in fact, he's the one who calls Paul on it. Why do you persecute me? Those were his words to him. Why do you persecute me? He knew exactly what Paul had done wrong. And yet, what does Paul say? There's a crown laid up for me which the Lord, what judge? The righteous judge, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. Because if you're in Jesus, if you're in Jesus, you can be free of the yoke of self-loathing, shame, and guilt. Because in Romans chapter 8, it says, this is therefore now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're not in Christ, that's a conversation that needs to be had. But if you are in Christ, there's no condemnation. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh. Remember that law? What was the weak part of it? it wasn't the law. It's holy and righteous and good. Weakened by the flesh, us. Could not do. He has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now we start getting back to that law of liberty, freedom. The law of the New Testament isn't liberty in the sense of, oh, we can do whatever we want and live however we please. That's not what he came to set you free from. In Galatians 5, it says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole law. Do not go back to trying to live based off of your merits of getting it all figured out and doing it just right. You take that path, you're going to have to live by that path, and you and I both know exactly how that works. It does not end well. But Christ's law, it sets you free because it, it is a law of liberty. And in James 1, he says it. And in James 2, he says it. And after he says it in James chapter 2, verse 12, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. I want you to turn and look at verse 13. Because you want to know why it's a law of liberty? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Those four words make all the difference. The law that we're under, mercy triumphs over judgment. Jesus lived a perfect life, and if he just left the earth at that point, all we'd be left with is, oh, yeah, God's right. We could have done it right, and we didn't, but he doesn't. Where does he go? He doesn't go straight back up to heaven. Where does he go first? He goes to Calvary. He goes to die so that you and I might have mercy. Look, I want you to listen to me. If you haven't listened to anything else in this sermon, I understand. But I want you to listen to this one thing. If you are in Christ, you do not need to get up every morning and worry about whether you're lost and then three minutes later think, oh, maybe I'm saved now. and then. 
five minutes later you do something and you go, oh, I think I'm lost again. You do not need to live that way. And in fact, that's not even good news. That's a horrible way to live. And we do it sometimes. It's not what you were intended for. That's not your purpose. Right? This, this quarter, we're talking about you need, every soul needs purpose. Your purpose is to tell everybody about Jesus who has saved you from your sins because mercy triumphs over judgment. And you can't do that if you keep going back to that way of thinking of like, I guess I'm not good enough. Of course you're not good enough. Of course you're not good enough. That's the whole point. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We will not reach the lost if we do not believe we are saved. And some of us, and I will tell you, I'm not just saying some of us like some of you. I mean, the guy in the mirror some days gets so wrapped up in thinking, am I good enough? That I, I, can't, I can't reach the lost with the message of, well, I kind of hope maybe possibly I'll get into heaven. You reach the loss with Paul's message of, I have fought the good fight. And there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me. And it will be given to me by the righteous judge who will award it to me on that day because his son died for me and mercy triumphs over judgment. That's our purpose. So yeah, I do want to step on your toes today. If you've been living in self-loathing and guilt and shame as a constant process as a Christian. And you've told yourself, well, that's just, that's just the way it is. It shouldn't be. And I want you to walk out and give glory to God for his grace. Because if you do not do that, then you have missed the good news. And you're still back under that old law. Trying to think, how can I do it right? It's not what he means. May we glorify God for his grace. At this time, we offer an invitation. And this is why. This whole sermon is why. Because you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all squared away. You don't have to know everything. What you need to know is, I need to be in Christ. And I need to follow him, no matter how much I struggle in that journey, and I'm going to fall on my face along the way. I need to be in Christ, and I need to follow him. If you want to be in Christ, those who are baptized are baptized into Christ. If you are ready for him to be your Lord and Master, mercy triumphs over judgment. If you're ready for that kind of a Master, do not wait any longer. The water's right here. Be baptized into Christ and join those who have such good news for their souls. Please take advantage of that as we stand and sing the invitation song.